my main application domain is uh, plasma science, fusion energy science, with a very specific uh, DOE mission of delivering clean energy through the fusion energy process. And, but this is not what this talk is focused on. It's really t flipping things upside down and really focusing on the uh, challenges in extreme scale computing, how you want to harness that technology to accelerate progress in domain application areas such as fusion energy sciences and as a, uh, as a uh, possible uh, uh, application domain where you can demonstrate progress. So um, um, these are my uh, many collaborators at different institutions. And um, let me get right into it. This is a, um, uh, this is really serves as an outline of my talk. Uh, the, uh, the focus will be on HPC performance scalability and portability in a representative DOE application domain, this being the fusion energy science domain. What we're going to focus on here is uh, to illustrate how, uh, uh, by focusing on a domain application that delivers discovery level science that it, you know it's not just a scaling exercise or whatever you can actually deliver some new science uh, uh, that exhibits good performance scaling while also helping provide viable metrics in the modern world today on top supercomputing systems uh, including issues such as portability on different architectural platforms time to solution this is the real coin of the realm for applications, how fast can you carry out the, uh, a, re, uh, a really important um, computation? And this is very important these days, uh, that uh, it's not just a question of uh, running, running uh, big major application codes on a big supercomputing system. As you compare performance on the different supercomputing systems, what's the level of energy consumption? What's the comparative metric for, for looking at that? So um, I'm, uh, this is a, a paper that was published uh, not that long ago by myself and my colleagues in Computing in Science and Engineering that will speak more of the language of what we're talking about today rather than a pure uh, fusion energy science type paper. Uh, the current progress that I'll be talking about today it involves the deployment of innovative algorithms within a modern code that delivers new scientific insights on world-class systems. This is, uh, I'm very grateful to colleagues at the major supercomputing centers around the world. Uh, we have, uh, including, of course, the US. In fact, most of our start came courtesy of Paul and company here at Argonne over the years. And uh, we started with the earlier versions of BlueGene and, and uh, uh, up to Mira. And then we, we're, uh, we, we have uh, this code deployed on Sequoia, the big brother to Mira at, at Livermore. Uh, the K computer, which was the number one machine for a while from Japan. Um, Titan in China, which was number one in China for a while. Peace Dant, the top supercomputer in Europe. Um, Blue Waters, uh, NS, NSF's largest uh, compute system. Stampede, which is... Uh, uh, big Xeon Phi system uh, at, uh, N at the NSF Supercomputing Center in Texas, and Tianhe 2, of course, which is in China. In the near future, because uh, things keep on moving, uh, we expect to exercise the software on Summit via this uh, Oak Ridge uh, CAR program, which is an early science for their big 100 petaflop system. Uh, Cori, which is the uh, system at, at um, uh, the the uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, this is a next generation Xeon Phi system. Stampede 2 also is quite similar. Uh, this, is the, this is the NSF system that will soon be deployed. Tsubami 3 is a lead system in Japan that is yet to be deployed. This is a, based on accelerator technology, and I'll uh, get onto that. Um, comments on future progress. Uh, is uh, here the applied math emphasis is important. Um, as Jack Nangara said earlier, and other people have, have uh, reemphasized, uh, you can't just sit on what you've got right now. You have to keep on innovating because the uh, extreme concurrency and parallelism is getting more extreme. It's not getting less extreme. And in looking uh, and even participating in a few of the early science briefings, uh, uh, in this CAR program leading to Summit, um, that seems to be more and more the case. 
So uh, locality uh, challenges, uh, uh, improved solvers uh, are all very much needed. So the interdisciplinary crosscuts that are uh, required with the applied mathematicians, applied ma mathematics is extremely important. So, um, so let's go forward with this. This is a slide that uh, um, Jack Dungara gave me uh, not too long ago. Uh, Jack spoke in the opening session this morning. This shows the uh, really incredible cr progress in supercomputing over the years. And um, he highlights the following that, that uh, uh, if, you, if you look at this, his, his, uh, his uh, laptop and his iPhone were already, uh, I mean, it, here was the uh, level achieved on the big supercomputing platforms and you know, back uh, in the mid 90s here and here by the turn of the century. And things move so fast that you really have to keep abreast of this. And my point to everyone is, is really that uh, you really owe it to yourself in the application domains to embrace these exciting technological advances to accelerate progress. And uh, you know, you, you've moved beyond the abacus and the slide rule and such. You should keep on moving nowadays, too. So um, what am I talking about in terms of uh, um, why will the, the people in the uh, funding agencies and such provide uh, resources for software development and such. Um, you have to first make the case uh, from an applications perspective, the actual value of extreme scale HPC to scientific domain applications and industry. What have you delivered? What's your level of credibility and so forth? So the context really is, it's, I think this is very timely in terms of the recent White House announcement of the National Strategic Computing Initiative that came um, that most of you have heard. This is uh, this. I think this is very exciting. It's a very good thing. Uh, they don't identify uh, the specific level of resources, but this is very encouraging to DOE, NSF, and other agencies. Um, uh, Bill Gropp, who addressed you some time ago, I chatted with him recently about this. This is he said this is a very positive thing for NSF's ambitions in terms of moving more aggressively in this direction. But he characterized this uh, drawing, the analogy of the carrot on a stick. This is the stick. We want to see the beautiful carrot that's, that's on the end of it to uh, uh, further stimulate progress. So in terms of practical considerations, in terms of getting the buy-in from the agencies and, and so forth that would fund activities of this ki kind is um, that um, you have to move beyond, and you know, once you deliver the software to advance things, you have to move beyond what are what we call voracious codes more, uh, that just deliver more of the same, just bigger and faster. You're not really gaining uh, uh, outstanding or transformational new insights that speak to achieving major new levels of scientific understanding. Um, so you have to be able to point to these sorts of things before people will sit up and pay attention. You, uh, Catherine talked about this, the importance of uh, experimental validation, um, verification, and also uncertainty quantification to enhance what? The realistic predictive capability of both what we call hypothesis-driven or first principles-based predictive codes, as well as big data-driven statistical approaches. Another area of real excitement that uh, uh, I've been personally engaged in the last couple of years, but uh, will not talk about here, is large data-driven machine learning type approaches to predictions on really complex problems. Very exciting area. So um, we have to deliver software engineering tools in this enterprise to improve what I said earlier, time to solution, as well as modern considerations of energy to solution. It better, you better not need a fusion reactor to power your supercomputer. So, so the point is that, that um, the, uh, these are very practical considerations today in the application domain. David Keyes, who also addressed you all earlier uh, in, in, in this program, um, comments that billions of dollars of scientific software worldwide hangs in the balance until better algorithms arrive to span the quote unquote architecture applications gap, okay? Applications gap, and this is very much in line with what we're talking about in, the, in terms of applications challenges. So what are the associated challenges? You can speak to the hardware complexity. Uh, you've heard much discussion of this. Uh, heterogeneous uh, multi-core systems, 
both involving accelerators, GPU and CPU hybrid systems. The next generation of that, the 100 petaflop system in the U.S. will be the, the Summit machine at Oak Ridge. The MIC plus CPU uh, approach will be, uh, feet, will be the uh, architectural focus of Aurora coming down, downstream, uh, uh, championed by Argonne National Lab. The software challenges involve what? Rewriting code focused on data locality. And rewriting code, this comes in various steps. Uh, it doesn't mean that the existing legacy codes are, are not useful. They continue to be useful. They'll continue to be more solidly validated and so forth. And what do they serve? And so I tell my students, basically, you come up with new schemes and things like that but you better first be able to do the cross benchmark checks. These are verification exercises that you can still deliver the goods. And because nobody will believe your fancy new code un until you've done those verification cross checks at some level. This could be code to code comparisons. It could be uh, analytic sorts of benchmarks and so forth. The, soft, uh, the applications imperative, the accountability aspect that those of us in the application domains uh, should, should pay attention to is you need to provide specific examples of impactful science and mission advances enabled by progress from what? From terascale to petascale, uh, from terascale to petascale to today's multi-petascale HPC app capability. So, you know, no one has collective Alzheimer's. You know, you, people know that these big machines have been around and keep on progressing. What have you done with them? Because it's easy to put your hand out and say, I want more cycles. I want to be able to do this. But what have you delivered? Are you st strictly talking about voracious calculations? Or have you really delivered transformational new science? So let's talk about this particular application domain of fusion energy. It's a very exciting activity. Uh, Actually, um, this is a magnetic trap, uh, large, this is a big donut shaped machine, uh, um, a clever use of uh, uh, con configuring magnetic fields to keep a very hot gas called a plasma made up of charged particles um, away from the, from the uh, uh, surrounding vessel. This is a fundamental fusion reaction. You take the isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, which is plentiful in, the, in, in water, and uh, you make um, uh, this, this reaction, which according to Einstein's rule, uh, the, the products have less mass than, 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 the, than the starting, starting uh, elements here. And uh, it leads to an energy multiplication factor of 450 to 1. Um, this idea has been around for a long time. People uh, jokingly say fusion is the energy source of the future and always will be the energy source of the future. But there has been really very dramatic progress over the years since I was a graduate student. Uh, uh, we've gone up uh, many orders of magnitude. And actually, uh, about 12 years ago or, or more, at the Joint European Tourist Device in, in the UK, um, uh, near breakeven was achieved. Energy out equals ener ener energy in. And this gave rise, to, inspired uh, the push towards a burning plasma device, which could give you a, a success ratio of, of 10, 10 or beyond. And um, so there's several issues involved in, in confining the, 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 this very hot plasma. This is like having a sun on Earth type, a star on Earth type, type situation. So it's very exciting, uh, extremely hot gas of charged particles, uh, ions and electrons, several hundred million degrees. Um, and uh, there are two issues. There's uh, big fluid-like macroscopic events that lead to an immediate termination of the discharge and can damage the vessel. These are called disruptions. And uh, that, that is something that uh, one has to be able to resolve at very, very high efficiency. And um, there's still work in that area. And this is an area that I personally believe that the uh, machine learning sorts of statistical methods will give you the answers first. The first principles type approaches are very good for, for uh, studying turbulence. And so an elevator speech type explanation of this is, is that uh, if you're going to be successful in confining a hot plasma to deliver energy, it's sort of analogous to building a house. You know, uh, the, the big disruptive sorts of events are like your earthquakes and such. You don't want to build your house around there. But even if you do, 
um, you can't perfectly insulate the house. So there will always be thermodynamic losses that are balanced by the fusion energy production rate, and that determines the size and cost of your reactor, and that's what this is all about. So that's the perspective. Uh, this is ITER. This is the, the next generation uh, fusion uh, power system or, or uh, burning plasma experiment that is due for operation in about 2025 or so. It's a $25 billion experiment that involves the participation of governments representing over half the world's population. And um, this is a very exciting endeavor. In fact, uh, uh, not too long ago on CNN, Fareed Zaharia in his series called uh, 21st Century Moonshots. This is one of the 21st Century Moonshots. What does that, what does that mean? It mean, well, he's, it was, you know, he's, he's, uh, I, he's one of my personal favorites. He's very articulate, very, very intelligent. And he's saying that the governments of this world need to excite the young people by really embracing 21st century type challenges of the kind that JFK uh, promoted, uh, moonshots. And he said, we have our own 21st century moonshots. And he went through about six of these and one of these, uh, and featured in, at different times, and one was fusion, and he said this is like capturing um, a, a star on, on Earth, and he gave, gave a nice picture of the facility that's being built right now, this, the, the ITER facility. So where does this connect to HPC? Realistic HPC-enabled simulations are required, absolutely demanded, to cost-effectively plan, steer, and harvest key information, these things, these are long pulse shots that uh, will cost about a million dollars a run, uh, a, a run to operate. Yes. Uh, so uh, in the last in the last slide, you mentioned uh, AP neutral simulation. So did you uh, so did you mean the uh, density functional theory methods, the AP initial methods? Machine learning approaches. No, uh, the AP initial uh, simulation. Maybe I, I missed something. Um, I, I'm saying that there's two general classes of, uh, of computational simulations that, that predict behavior. One are first principles hypothesis-driven approaches where you put, set down basic equations that you solve. This is 95% uh, of what we know about, basically. The more, um, uh, the, the more recent emphasis has been on big data-driven discovery, okay? This uses advanced statistical method, methods, techniques, software like uh, support vector machines and such, which, which help you predict uh, the uh, behavior in very complex sorts, sorts of systems. The biological sciences use this more because unlike many of the physical sciences, including this one, you don't have a classical equations to, to, to help steer the direction. Yeah, okay. uh, and how, how do you model the um, magnetic field? So do you modify the Hamiltonian of the equations? Well, uh, let me get into that, okay? You'll, you'll see everything, okay? Uh, well, not everything. We'll see how far we can go. Um, so here it is. You, you want the equations? Uh, the Boltzmann-Maxwell system of equations is what we use, okay? And uh, the Boltzmann equation is a nonlinear PDE in Lagrangian coordinates. F is the um, thermodynamic distribution function. It represents the ensemble of particles in the system. The um, particle pushing aspects are linear ODEs. This is a, these are just simple F equals MA type equations. This is the velocity, this is acceleration. You know this from your high school physics. The Klimantovich Dupree representation just tells you how you represent the distribution of particles in the system. Now, in addition to this, you have to resolve the forces that push these uh, charged particles throughout the system. Um, so the electri uh, electric and magnetic fields are governed by the field equations. Uh, this is for uh, electrostatic forces, electric fields, and then a similar structure for the uh, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. They're all linear PDEs in the Eulerian coordinates of the lab frame. This is a well-defined system of equations to solve, uh, but it's a lot simpler looking than it actually is, because when you actually try to solve this, this is very, very challenging. Um, so, um, so it is very challenging, and, and uh, in order to make progress, uh, especially in a particle and cell type, type approach, you don't want to push Avogadro's number of particles, and that's, uh, of course, impossible to do. And so one tries to reduce this to the 
For the fusion problem, we do the averaging over the very fast gyro motion of the particles along the field line and produce the gyrokinetic Vlasov Poisson system of equations. The numerical approach that we adopt is the gyrokinetic particle and cell pick method. Um, this is just a schematic of it. The objective is to develop an efficient numerical tool uh, to realistically simulate turbulence and associated transport in, a, in magnetically confined plasmas called tokamaks. The Russians invented this uh, using high-end supercomputers. This is if you looked at that donut-shaped structure that I showed. This is that donut-shaped structure. It's a 3D torus. This is the zeta. Uh, and this is the theta direction, and this is the radial direction. And in the typical calculations, you're dealing with about 130 million grid points, 30 billion particles, uh, and try to push things forward in an initial value simulation of about 10,000 time steps. Um, and uh, as you'll see in a minute, these are not Avogadro's uh, single particles. These are, these are really uh, uh, large particles that uh, um, and this is a schematic of it. So the charged particles sample the distribution function that you saw. Yeah? Do you need to explicitly solve, resolve the time scale associated with that Poisson equation, or can you kind of like step over it? Um, well, this is what I'm going to address right now. You know, you, you, you really are, um, because as, as scientists, you, you, you want to figure out what's big, what's small, and what, what you need to focus on. And so um, with regard to um, uh, how are you going to deal with the charged particles? You, you place them, uh, they, they come out of that distribution function that I wrote the equation for. You um, uh, put them on a grid because this kind of particle and cell simulation is a particle grid simulation. Particle grid as distinguished from uh, uh, many other kinds of, for example, appropriate to Monte Carlo type applications where it's just particle particle type processes. Okay, this is particle grid sort of thing. So here's the grid. The interactions occur on a grid with the forces determined uh, in, the, in the electric field or electrostatic limit by the gradient of the electrostatic potential that gives you a force calculated from the deposited charges. The grid resolution, and this is what I'm getting at here, uh, you don't have to deal with, with all scales. You, it's directed, dictated by the so-called Debye length, which uh, basically tells you in a nutshell from uh, undergraduate electromagnetic physics that, that um, you don't need to deal with uh, infinitely small particles, that, that uh, these are uh, large size or finite size particles that occupy a Debye sphere. And uh, so this reduces the, no you're still dealing with billions and billions of particles, but at least you don't have to deal with 10 to the 23rd particles to, to make sense. And this is well established. It's been in place for 50 years or so. The specific particle and cell operations involve a so-called scatter process or depositing the charges on this grid as nearest neighbors on the grid. You solve the Poisson equation, electrostatic equation for the potential, and then you gather the forces, which is the gradient of the electrostatic potential on each particle, and, this gives, and then you push these and then you repeat this process. This is the particle and cell approach for uh, uh, in, in this cartoon-like form. Now, uh, what's the basic structure of this? The system represents, is represented by a set of particles. Each particle carries the components, position, velocity, and weight. Um, this is the, 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 the scheme associates a weight with each particle and velocity position. The particles interact with each other through long-range electromagnetic forces. The forces are evaluated on a grid and then interpolated to the particle. This is an order n plus m log m um, uh, uh, process. The particle and cell approach involves two different data structures and two types of operations. The operations are the scatter-gather operations. The, the uh, data structures involve particles and, 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 and the grid. Um, the charge action, uh, the particle to grid interpolation, I just talked about the scatter process. The Poisson or the other electromagnetic field solves are Poisson-like structures to solve, solve, and, 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 uh, um, uh, solve on the grid and then use to accelerate the particles, and then you have the associated uh, interpolation. So getting now more to the application itself, um, um, I talked about uh, turbulence, microturbulence. These are 
particles interacting with each other, producing wave particle interactions where the waves suck up energy from the particles and start to grow. And this is very bad because it, it acts against the, the nice way that you've designed the magnetic fields and the electric fields to confine the plasma. So you want to be able to confine this as best you can, but it's impossible to completely do so. And so therefore, um, you, this whole area of uh, studying the microturbulence that, that emerges is very important. And as I, as I said earlier, the mission importance is that a fusion reactor size and cost is determined by the balance between these kinetically driven losses and the self-heating rates due to the fusion reactions. The scientific discovery is that we're able to use these very scalable codes to predict performance in, in uh, confinement performance in systems that haven't been built yet, like ITER, and is correlated against, uh, benchmarked against uh, earlier observations. This shows a negative trend, whereas the system get, gets bigger and bigger, the, this is, this is a, uh, indicates the confinement trend, which is getting worse. But instead of continuing to follow this, which would be disastrous for future prospects, it does roll over. And um, the, to cut to the chase on this, this was done about a dozen years ago. And I've always been troubled by this result in the sense that uh, for the largest size system, there's no free lunch. I mean, uh, you know, you can do with a modest size uh, confinement machine existing in the US that's more, more like in this A and B category. But if you go to these really large machines, the problem size increases. And you better have much better resolution. At that time, we did the best that we did, as indicated here. But, the, the, but you, you really have to engage modern technology to be able to carry out uh, solutions of increasing problem size at scale. And this requires code rewrite. It involved uh, various activities, including insight projects in which we participated. We were really uh, very much uh, helped by this uh, G8. This is the real G8 business. Uh, uh, there was a fusion exascale project in this area. And the interesting part of this is this provided us access to try out our schemes on um, leading supercomputing platforms in other parts of the world. And so lesson learned from all of this is that um, the, uh, these particle and cell codes really scale very well, but it's a constant challenge to, um, to rewrite the code, to constantly improve it. Doesn't mean you throw out the old codes. You keep the old codes, keep them working and, and cross benchmarking, uh, validating against observations. But as you bring the new products in, this is a very exciting cycle. And um, so the efficient usage, as I said, of the current leadership class facilities worldwide does demand that you rewrite code featuring the modern computer science applied math methods addressing locality and memory demands. And for example, um, uh, we, we, uh, we started out with, the, with Fortran-based codes and then went to C language codes and in, in involving the introduction of not just MPI, as was noted earlier, which were fine on the earlier um, uh, uh, earlier generations of the Blue Gene systems, but with systems like Mira, uh, forget it. You had to go to OpenMP for the multi-threading and such, and and that was quite exciting in in terms of the successes engaged and and the ability to demonstrate really improved time to solution and when, when you are able to do this. So um, this is jumping further further forward now. This is much more recent activities. Uh, so uh, as I said, I want to illustrate some aspects of code portability. And we're very lucky that, that we have good relationships with, as a result of the G8 activity and, and other activities, we've been able to get our particular piece of software, this called the GTC Princeton code, on the top seven supercomputers in the world as compiled by Jack Dungara. And this is still the case. This is still, these are still the top seven supercomputers. So this shows peak performance and flops. This, is, this shows the degree of usage in terms of used nodes over unused nodes. And um, so the portability of a aspects of this is well demonstrated. These are broad range of leading multi-petaflop supercomputers worldwide that we're able to deploy this particle and cell code on. The percentage in, in dark here uh, indicates the fraction of overall nodes that currently util utilize uh, these numerical experiments, are used for numerical experiments. 
Um, the results in this figure, the caveat is that uh, we haven't made sufficient progress to engage the, the Xeon Phi nodes yet. It's very hard to go beyond about a thousand nodes. And um, we're learning as we go. I'll have a future slide on this and what the challenges are. But it's very encouraging because on certain systems like uh, Mira and Sequoia, we were able to use 100% of the machine. And uh, the kind of calculations we were able to deliver in terms of the discovery science part of it, um, we wouldn't have dreamed about achieving about even three or four years ago. So um, it's, it's really very stimulating. And the young people engaged in all of this uh, are very stimulated by this because we're, you're doing something very different. Now, this again shows this, um, this is like a measure of the, of the uh, confinement losses. And this is um, the, the system size. And um, I showed you this A, B, C, D plot before, increasing problem size. And uh, this, these were new physics results that just came out where we improved the physics model to go beyond a simple representation of the electron dynamics to include one that included wave particle resonances and so forth. And yet we're, we, we, were, we benchmarked this against work in the field that we're able to come up to about this size system. And we were the first to deliver something on this eater scale size, size, size device. So we're happy to be able to do this in a reasonable uh, execution time. Um, this is again reiterating, and I, there's a reason why I'm going through this right now. These are, this is the GTCP piece of software. Uh, this stands for Gyrokinetic Toroidal Code Princeton. And these are the six operations. And the people that do performance modeling and such, uh, they, they really like uh, uh, this kind of a PIC code because uh, you can focus on about six specific operations and things to, to try to do your optimization exercises on. And these are as listed. I've talked about some of these already. But you know, you'll keep these slides. You can come back and lo look at these things. And the reason that I'm highlighting all of these things is when we do our application deployment on all of these different supercomputing platforms, we keep track of all of these operations, and they're tabulated. And so this is what I mean here. There they are, you know, um, listed up here. And this is, uh, shows the operational breakdown of time per step uh, when using 80 million grid points, 8 billion ions, 8 billion kinetic electrons on 4,000 nodes on Mira, Titan, and Peace Dent. This is the top supercomputer in Europe right now, a GP, modern GPU CPU system, distinguished by the fact that they have the most advanced uh, communications capability on that system. Um, and uh, Titan is, of course, the uh, big US machine, the, the GPU CPU machine at Oak Ridge. And Mira, of course, is our um, uh, homogeneous system here at Argonne. Um, what this shows, the vertical scale shows the wall clock time uh, per ion step. And uh, um, you don't want to be real high on this. It just shows that uh, you know, the time to complete the calculation is, is longer as you go up this way. This is with CPU only. And not surprisingly, with CPU and GPU, you do improve. And this shows the breakdown of each of those operations. And so uh, for our computer science colleagues and such to focus on how can you improve performance, you can see where uh, you might try to reduce certain specific pieces of this, uh, of this uh, uh, breakdown. So um, overall, we, we looked at a variety of supercomputers worldwide. We carried out true weak scaling type studies on, with increasing problem size. So that's not hard for people to understand. As you go from a small system to larger and larger systems, you require much more compute power, higher resolution. And um, you have to worry about time to solution, energy to solution. There's about over 3 million particles per process in these computations. We looked at it both. Uh, uh, tabulating things in terms of one MPI process per node and also one MPI process per NUMA node. Uh, NUMA stands for, as you know, non-uniform memory access issues. So they tabulate a little bit differently. But again, to um, uh, better communicate with our inter interdisciplinary way with our com uh, computer science colleagues, we uh, tracked all of this activity. This is kind of a, a tabulation. This is for the NVIDIA Kepler, the specifications for that. This is the IBM Blue Gene Q mirror system. 
the Cray XK7 Titan system. This is the Peace Dance system, and the distinguishing feature of this that really makes it shine is, is, the, is the interconnect, the Aries Dragonfly Network. I'll show you some results from that, which uh, um, are really quite impressive relative to the Titan system. And, and it's a lesson learned that, that uh, as you go to the 100 petaflop systems, that you better pay a lot of attention to the communications, at least for a number of these um, key applications, uh, like the one we're talking about here. So I'm not going to go through all of this. You, you know, it's, it just tabulates information. And this is a further tabulation. The, uh, this is the Dell Cluster Stampede at, at, uh, in Texas. Um, this is Blue Waters, the NSF largest system at uh, NCSA. And this is uh, the uh, Intel Xeon Phi Stampede. And this gives the specifications. Let's look at results. This is what I was talking about. The weak scaling of the, of the, of the code, the GPU version of the code, on the heterogeneous GPU CPU system Titan and Peace Dan. Titan is the system in the US uh, at Oak Ridge. Peace Dan is the system in Europe. It's not as powerful as Titan. It doesn't have as many processors. But it has uh, the most modern communications network. And so what you see plotted here, this is again the, our familiar wall clock time. This is problem size, A, B, C, and D coming across this way. So as you increase the problem size, the ideal operation is to try to make this as flat as possible, that if you increase the problem size, the, um, uh, the wall clock time doesn't go up significantly. And so um, the top two uh, lines here, the purple line is uh, Titan CPUs. This is the Peace Dance CPU, which, which is better because of the communications. But then when you turn on the GPUs, of course, the execution time, time to solution comes down. But uh, this is not behaving all that wonderfully in terms of it keeps on going up as you increase the problem size. But here, you see this is getting more and more flat. So the clear winner here, and it, it'll be um, demonstrated in other tests that we, numerical tests that we did. And this is really, you use the same code for all of these cases, the performance difference solely due to the hardware system software. And we identify this as primarily due to the communications, the Aries the Aries Dragonfly network is really good. And this is a little bit hard to absorb. This is infor informational background. A, B, C, and D represent the different problem sizes. This is the breakdown of all the things that I mentioned, all the particle and cell operations along the line that I showed earlier. But this is show and so the vertical scale is the wall clock time for 100 time steps. And this, this is a plot for one MPI per NUMA node. And this next one is one MPI per node. Other people prefer to look at it this way. But I won't dwell on this. You can go back and look at this and, and see if you're really serious about deploying modern software on different platforms for portability purposes, you break down things in this way and track things systematically. Now, this is a different way of plotting the results. Uh, but um, the previous was weak scaling. We're going to come back to this. Strong scaling challenges are also very, very important. Here we only show the results uh, for Mira, Titan, and Peace Dant. Um, this is using the simpler uh, physics model uh, within this GTCP code, where I told you I, we used a much more complicated electron dynamical model. But this was just starting off. And, and, we, and we used the simpler model. Um, and strong scaling for what? Fixed problem size. Uh, fixed problem meaning 131 million grid points to represent the problem, 13 billion particles from 512 nodes on what? On the Titan system, Mira system, and Peace Dance system. And this is a uh, uh, log log axis. And uh, what you see here is that uh, the, um, here's Mira, and um, the, the, the weak scaling is, uh, the strong scaling is really quite good. And all of them are, are, are reasonably good until you go to larger problem size. And, and you could not go to larger problem size because Peace, here because Peace Dent didn't have that many more processors. But if you look at this, this is the lowest one on the scale here. And so it, again, exhibits the best performance. This is a real warning sign to tighten and, and to be careful about their communications. If they're, you know, the, the Aries, this, the big difference here is the Aries network, OK? And so studies, application studies like this are very valuable 
to the, to the machine designers in a co-design sense too, just highlighting what kind of uh, systems are uh, deployments of uh, particular kinds of uh, hardware. In this t uh, case, it's the communications capability. And this is, um, this is a strong scaling results. Again, this is uh, the difference between these two plots uh, because from the physics perspective, you want to see what happens if you really use a much more complicated electron model. And you see the same trend, basically. But the strong scaling, uh, but we're real happy about this because we we're able to, again, demonstrate the strong scaling trend um, in this code, even though the, the electron dynamics got a lot more complicated. Um, this one here shows the comparative weak scaling time to solution for six HPC platforms. Um, this is focusing on the simple electron model for the four different problem sizes. And the problems ran at 12 and a half, 25, 50, and 100 percent of the maximum nodes used for each system. What do you get out of this? Well, again, this wall clock time plot basically shows again that um, you want the, uh, as you increase the problem size, you, you want this to be as flat as possible. And uh, if you look at the mirror re results here, um, um, uh, compared compare to the others, the, the weak scaling is, is, is really quite good. Um, and um, so here we also included a Stampede. And I'll say more about this. This is the Xeon Phi system. This is the K computer result from the top supercomputer presently in Japan. This is Sequoia, the, 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 the big de, uh, defense program machine at, at Livermore that allowed us on because we demonstrated the ability to, uh, with almost perfect weak scaling on, on, on Mira. Um, and so this is the Titan and Peace Dance. So this is here. I don't expect you to immediately absorb what this says, but these are interesting results that were just uh, uh, obtained recently. This is with a fully kinetic electron version of all of this, and again, looking at all of these different different platforms. So, um, so what is the what is the open challenge in terms of the portability uh, uh, onto these top seven supercomputers? And it very obviously has to do with the Xeon Phi systems. Okay, why were we not able to do better? And so uh, we've uh, we've had some productive collaborative studies with. Uh, the, uh, the, the Tianhe Tu people in China, and what have we done so far, and how, how do we want to proceed? And I wanted to convey that to you also. The, um, so what we've done so far is we, we measured the MPI bandwidth between CPU to the, CP, uh, uh, to the CPU host system, mic to mic uh, the, the, in the native mode, and the CPU to mic in the so-called symmetric operation on TH2, these are all the different possibilities that, that, that they look at. But the message that they came back to us with was, if you want to go to engage more than 1,000 processors, which of course, you know, they have many more than 1,000 processors, you have to go to the, what they call an offload mode version, develop that for this GTCP code uh, to facilitate using many uh, mics on one compute node. The associated investigations have included uh, true weak scaling performance with increasing problem size and, uh, and, face, and, and improved face space resolution, we weren't able to get very far with that in, in terms of really demonstration, much, demonstrating much improved performance. And even starting with the smallest problem size on 224 of these uh, Tianhe 2 nodes. Um, and, we went, we, and the larger problem size we did find on the Tianhe 2 CPU system, which is interesting too. But this is a real challenge here, deployment of one mic, two mics, three mics, respectively, for these weak scaling performance studies. And that is still in progress. And so, this is, uh, so there's still plenty to do. Now, um, our collaborations with our NSF colleagues at, uh, on the Stampede system at Texas, um, uh, we've been working on improving the intranode communications between the host and the mics, just like the other, to reduce the overhead in the MPI uh, scatter operation, improve the internode communications between mics uh, for the another operation. We've had uh, uh, NDA type collaborations with the Intel people uh, uh, to optimize particle loading for symmetric runs to explore the KNC intrinsics. 
uh, more actively, uh, we're, we're moving more actively into the next phase of true weak scaling uh, and trying to engage up to 4,000 mic nodes. And so this is just a progress report and says that basically there's a lot of interesting things going on. Um, this, uh, this again is just looking again at the, uh, at the code with the full electron model and, and showing the, the, the scaling trends for Mira, Titan, and Peace Dant. And um, uh, the, um, uh, it again reemphasizes the notion that um, here is Mira. It does very, very well. But uh, the, um, uh, in terms of the wall clock time, uh, but ultimately, in terms of time to sol uh, the, uh, if you if you really want the uh, um, to to get the maximum performance uh, uh, of the of the next generation systems, there are additional uh, aspects of this one has to take into account, and that is that is shown here. Uh, we uh, we st in the last um, half year or so. We started to look at these energy to solution estimates for again those those systems Mira, Titan, and Peace Dant. The, the centers all were tremendously cooperative with us, and um, so what do we do here? This is this is interesting to look at because this is a uh, rather uh, you know not very conventional in terms of application domain studies. So what do we what is this bottom line here? This is the energy in kil kilowatt hours, the energy per ion time step in kilowatt hours by each system platform for the weak scaling kinetic electron studies. This is using every bit of physics that we had in, in, in the code at this time. You did the simple multiplication to get this bottom line. And what do we have here? This is, uh, first we looked at CPUs only. This is the number of nodes across the systems. Uh, this is the power per node tabulated here. The time steps, this is time to solution. And, um, and, and this is what you get in terms of energy to solution. And what you extract from this is the following, that uh, um, Mira here uh, took almost 14 um, seconds or so. Uh, this took, Titan took about the same range, and, and Peace Dant did a little better here. And, uh, but the uh, energy consumption was the least for Mira here, which is very good. But the fact is that the, um, um, that the time to solution uh, improvement here is significant. And so you want to move in this direction. And so uh, what we then did was say, OK, let's move away from the purely homogeneous system, look at the heterogeneous CPU plus GPU system, and do this comparison. And um, here what you find is that you know, if you want to improve the time to solution um, uh, moving from, from here to, to here. Uh, the, um, for Peace Dant, uh, you, you went up, uh, you significantly improved in time to solution on a big major calculation by better than a factor of two. But the energy consumption was n is not that bad. It didn't go, it, it's just about 1.84 or so. So this may be worth the cost. Titan didn't do so well. and so. But you know this is work in progress, but it's the kind of work that needs to be done, especially as you investigate the new um, uh, the new platforms that are being developed. The the power energy estimates were obtained from system instrumentation, including compute nodes, network blades, AC to DC conversion, etc. Yeah, you had a question. It seems very unfair to claim that you're only using an additional 15 watts for a GPU on Titan. Why do you think it's unfair? If you unplug the GPU from the socket, that would drop by a lot more than 50 watts. I mean, that's a 150 watt, at least 200 watt part. Well, but practically you're not doing that, right? Sure, but if you're buying a machine, you have a choice to populate that slot or not. Well, yeah. It, it, as I said, you, but you, you're fully cognizant of what's, what's at stake here. So you want to do the practical comparison. And so the practical world is looking at this and saying, time to solution is important to us. And so what price are we willing to pay for engagement of the accelerators? It's not a question of fairness, not fairness. Fairness or not fairness is being transparent about these things. And, and these are, you know, these studies are less than six months old. And uh, all of the different facilities uh, uh, at Argonne and at the, um, at the Swiss Supercomputing Center 
and at uh, Oak Ridge have been very cooperative in working with us. They're not going to give us these figures to make themselves look bad. This is what they've done in terms of telling us this is what we understand the situation is. This is not a publicity sort of, sort of, sort of effort to try to say the system is bad or not. We're doing compar comparisons here. So, I mean, your point is well taken, but uh, this, is a, this is a story that will be continued. So, um, uh, but the important thing is this is also very much of interest to the people that are developing the next generation systems. Uh, you know, as we move up in the U.S. to the 100 petaflop systems and people abroad also look at this and they, and they say, yeah, this is what we're also very interested in, in, in uh, observing. So um, the portability issue versus speed up studies uh, is, is also um, quite interesting. This is something that uh, was inspired by some discussions that I had with Rick Stevens. He, he and Pete Beckman always were saying to me, well, what's the cost of doing all of this, being making it portable? You know, how much time are you spending? How many lines of code are you changing? And so forth. And, and so this is an um, initial crack at this sort of thing. So we uh, classified this in, this in terms of the architecture, what is, how much did it cost for the GPU offload, and then our early efforts on the Xeon Phi offload. And the way to interpret this, this is for two major operations in, in, in the actual execution code. This is the push operation and the sort operation for the electrons. And um, so what you see here is that with the GPU, you went up by a factor of five here, and you ch at an expense of changing about 700 lines of code for this particular operation. Um, and for the sort operation, it's a bit different, factor of two and about 407 lines of code. This shows the kind of still somewhat embryonic level of trying to improve the Xeon Phi offload. Uh, the speed up, it didn't speed up, it slowed down a bit and you changed about this many lines of code. This is about even for this second operation and, and you've changed very few lines of the basically C version of the code. So the number of lines of code, this, this is uh, lines of code change, uh, modified provides quantitative measures of the level of effort, if you will, uh, made to port and optimize this particular application code to a specific ar architecture. We consider to prototypical operations, the push and the sort operations for the electrons in these codes. Um, uh, with respect to the GPU, we looked at the single node Kepler that involves engagement of a single Sandy Bridge node. For the Xeon Phi, it was a single mic with two Sandy Bridge nodes. So this is, this is quite interesting and, and we will continue this kind of study as we, as we move forward in examining different architectures. So. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in your slide, in your uh, method, you have a one step you have to solve a Poisson equation, right? Well, the, the, there's different things involved. There's the particle push, which is which is um, uh, uh, these these push and sort operations. So, so, uh, the Poisson solve is to give you the force that's pushing the particles. Okay, so these are somewhat different operations. You know, one one solves for the field, which uh, gives you the forces that push the particles, yeah. and the other. For, uh, you know, tracks the particles. So the operations for the particle pushes are, are much more frequent. Yeah, so I, I, my question is that, uh, do, do you have a, a Poisson equation, I mean, Poisson solver using uh, GPU? Right, right, that, that, that's right. These are CPU solves, okay? This is, you're getting to a good, real good question, and that's a challenge for us in, in moving forward, is the solver, solver challenge. Right now, the solvers are not op uh, are, are not being engaged as much, you know, in terms of, of, of doing the, the the field solve for these electrostatic type problems. But if you go to the electromagnetic field solve, where you have more of these equations to solve now, the uh, the the speed of these um, of the, of the uh, of the solver becomes uh, much more important. They'll occupy a lot more of the execution time. And the other part of it is that the solvers, uh, you know, there's differences of opinion about this sort of things, but you have your, your uh, well-established solvers like Petsy, Trellinos, and so forth. And um, 
uh, they're also struggling with adapting to the modern platforms in, in terms of uh, how do you deal with, I, I think, you know, Petsy is still following the MPI line, and that, that's, you know, very tough relative to the multi-threading challenges that only OpenMP can, can, can help you with. So you raise a good question in terms of how is this all affected if you engage the solvers, and I think we'll get a real much better test of this when we go to the electromagnetic Im implementation where the solvers are needed to solve the electromagnetic field equations. Okay? Okay, um, so I'm, uh, so I, I should say something about this. Uh, the, so uh, the big hole, I think, at this stage in terms of demonstrating that we've, we're able to utilize very well the top seven supercomputers is that you can't get above about 1,000 processors on the Xeon Phi systems for now. We're not very efficient with doing that. And we've engaged the uh, expertise of, of uh, Torsten Hoffler and his colleagues. He's the head of the ETH uh, uh, Intel Center in, in Zurich to help us address this issue. And one of the local memory issues uh, is a so-called holes removal problem. What is this thing? So as we move the particles out of a local domain, they create a hole. And the number is no longer a valid particle location So in the associated memory space. So an efficient particle removal algorithm is needed to avoid exhausting the existent local memory. And there's various strategies for dealing with that. So you need to remove the hole periodically now but it's best to remove the holes completely if you can, so this involves designing the algorithm to do that. Vectorization is also needed in, in the guidance that we have from our colleagues there. You improve these push and charge operations. You need to deal with uh, two particles exhibiting different behaviors at different consecutive memory locations. This necessitates two separate instructions down to the computer level. Vectorization means using a single instruction for multiple data. So uh, latency issues, implementation of one-side MPI communication, what does that mean? The two-sided approach, which is usual, is, is synchronized, but it increases latency. The one-sided approach is unsynchronized. It helps with reducing latency. And all of these methods, hopefully, will help us be able to engage uh, many more processors in the Xeon Phi systems as they exist today. So um, before I get to the concluding slide, this is a, with regard to the applied math locality challenge, the schemes that we're using right now, these particle and cell schemes and such, are, are well established, they, they, they scale well and so forth. But if you have ambitions in going forward as, as we do, and this is where um, uh, a significant amount of uh, graduate student activity, engagement in a cross-disciplinary sense with uh, applied mathematicians that we've discussed this with at, at Princeton and other places is uh, um, to focus in particular in these particle schemes on uh, adapting a geometric Hamiltonian approach to solving the generalized Vlasov-Poisson equations. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, exhi exhibits some very exciting uh, promise. Uh, basically, you take your dynamical equations, uh, you write down the Hamiltonian, um, you can formulate the Lagrangian from that, from which you can formulate the action. You do a variational optimization of the action and then do the proper discretization. And this leads to um, what we call symplectic orbits for the particle motion. What does symplectic mean? In common language, symplectic just means this. You know how you do Runge-Kutta time advances, higher order Runge-Kutta advances? That's non-conserving. That's non-symplectic. And that means that if you wait long enough in time, if you're following these particles, they fall out of their orbits, where if you have a symplectic scheme, it's like the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps on going and going and going. And so that's a very nice, nice feature. Now, um, these, these uh, geometric Hamiltonian approaches, although they didn't, didn't identify them as such, were uh, uh, developed and applied uh, primarily by Kevin Bowers when he was at Los Alamos. He's written up in this article here ultra-high performance 3D electromagnetic relativistic uh, simulations. This is not what uh, we're doing with the gyrokinetic sort of things, but it provides the basic foundation for symplectic integration of particle orbits and fully electromagnetic fields without frequency ordering constraints. You know, they're, they're looking at very high frequency dynamics that are not of interest in magnetically confined plasmas. 
the foundational approach is it represents a foundational approach, I believe, for the present day simulations of laser plasma interactions on modern supercomputing systems. But it has one major drawback, and that is that with all of this firepower, it has limited applicability with respect to the size of the simulation region and the geometric complexity. So you can't apply this at all, really, to the magnetic fusion problems. The most promising approach here is this paper by my colleague at Princeton, Hong Chin, uh, that uh, focuses on same sort of approach, but to the gyrokinetic equations. And it provides a symplectic integration of the particle orbits uh, in electromagnetic low frequency plasmas uh, following this gyrokinetic ordering. But the problem is where uh, Bowers and company were able to formulate the field equations in a proper localized sense. Uh, we cannot at present identify a localized formulation for the field equation. They still look like a Poisson equation. And the Poisson equation is inherently global. And so this is an open challenge, but if we're able to do this, this could be very, very exciting for accelerating progress. I'm just showing this to you as an example that the modern uh, extreme scale computing challenges are truly interdisciplinary in many ways. So cross-cutting sorts of progress is, is, is really important to, uh, to uh, emphasize. So these are my concluding comments. Um, I presented, which I hope is a reasonably accessible um, picture of a modern HPC domain application code that's capable of scientific discovery, increasing problem size, that uh, provides good performance scaling and portability on some of the top supercomputing systems worldwide. And we've illustrated uh, metrics for time to solution and associated uh, early studies of energy to solution. This is, again, the reference that I noted earlier. Current progress is achieved, including the deployment of uh, innovative algorithms within a modern application code to deliver new scientific insights, as I showed, on world-class systems, uh, currently all of these listed. And we're looking forward to um, uh, collaborative interactions on these future systems as we, as we move forward. Future progress will require, as I just said in the previous slide, algorithmic, algorithmic as solver advances, you know, in, dress, in addressing the question earlier, enabled by applied math in an interdisciplinary co-design type environment together with computer science and extreme scale relevant uh, domain applications. So I'll uh, stop at this point.